Hey everybody, and Tony here with my review of Mozart's Idomeneo, which I saw at the Staatsoper unten in Linden. The conductor was Sir Simon Rattle. The production was done by David McVicker. The sets were done by Caroline Staunton, Colm Seary, and Vicky Mortimer. The costumes were done by Gabrielle Dalton. The lights were handled by Paul Constable. The choreographer was Colm Seary. The chorus master was Martin Wright. And the dramaturgs were Benjamin Wendtich and Elisabeth Kuhne. I was quite excited to see this production of Idomeneo at the Staatsoper und den Linden because David McVicker was the director of this production and if you know me I do like David McVicker because he does have some very interesting visions in terms of his collaboration with the set designers and costume designers and you need not look further than his productions of Die Zauberflöte at the Royal Opera House, Salome also at the Royal Opera House, as well as the Three Queens trilogy by Donizetti, i.e. Anna Bolena, Maria Stuarda, and Roberto de Vera at the Metropolitan Opera House. I do find his visions quite interesting, especially backed up with some intricate costume designs, and this particular production of Idomeneo was quite interesting, as well as boasted a cast that made me quite skeptical in terms of some of the casting decisions. I'm looking at you, Olga Peretiatko, as a letra. But before I get to the cast of singers, my thoughts on the production. I found it really interesting because David McVicker and his crew transported the action from ancient Greece, specifically Crete, to a sort of imaginary locale that was an amalgamation of feudal era Japan, the Middle East in the era of the Crusades, and select areas of Europe specifically between the 17th and the 18th centuries. Overseeing the stage is a huge skull to represent that this town is full of death, destruction, chaos, and tyranny. Therefore, people are suffering, they're under oppression, and they're in so much turmoil. And a new king needs to herald a new era of peace, love, tolerance, and harmony. The production also illustrates Idomeneo as a sort of tyrannical despot who's not really all that warm towards Idamante, his own son, and doesn't even want to give up his title as king, but he ends up being forced by Arbace, his most loyal right-hand man, and his followers to give up his title once Idamante escaped death and ends up marrying Ilya, thus making him not only unwilling to abdicate his title as king, but also end up going into the land of shadows and ghosts. And the costumes reflect Idomeneo, Eletra, Arbace, Idamante, Ilya, the high priest, and all the citizens in terms of who they're defined by. Idomeneo and Eletra sort of have a feudal era Japan style to them, with Idomeneo coming off as a sort of samurai, feudal era lord, and Middle Eastern warrior type of man to show that he is all about conquest, war, and just trying to take over all types of land. And Eletra, whose costume is extremely reminiscent of Lady Asaji from Akira Kurosawa's Throne of Blood, which in turn was his vision of Shakespeare's Macbeth set in feudal era Japan, and David McVicker's Eletra based on how she looks like Lady Asaji from Akira Kurosawa's Throne of Blood is really much in evidence because of how she also represents that execution mania that defines her as a feudal era lady, that want for power, as well as her desire to make everything remain with the old gods. Eletra is even followed by her two yokai onna or demon lady handmaidens to show that she is somebody who worships the ancient Japanese gods and is not willing to change anytime soon and is someone who is extremely proud of her Japanese heritage, although Eletra is originally from Mycenae, Greece. And the way Eletra ends Doreste Daiache is that you'd think she'll end up committing harakiri, but she puts her katana down and she ends up being spirited away, as if to state that there'll be no more death, no more slicing off heads, 
and no more sacrifices. Especially considering that Idomeneo also wields a katana to exercise his dominance as a feudal arrow lord and samurai who reigns all over people with death looming upon them as well as a tyrannical iron fist. So while Idomeneo and Eletra represent a feudal era style in which they are an amalgamation of Japanese and Middle Eastern, with Eletra going all out with her Japanese style, Idamante also has a cross design between the Japanese style and something more Middle Eastern to show that he is torn between two worlds and somebody who's trying to struggle between the feudal era Japanese side of his identity as well as the new identity that he wants to forge for the people considering that he is about to become the new king once he overcomes death. But while he is very happy to accept Ilya's hand in marriage and is also willing to accept his title as the king, he also ends up being very close to his father and even mourns for him once he also ends up getting spirited away. But Ilya, Arbace, and the people not only comfort him but assure him that he is the new king and that he will take his rule seriously. And speaking of Arbace and Ilya, they have a sort of 17th to 18th century style to them to show that they are more forward thinking and more progressive in how they tackle the world around them. Yes, Arbace may have been the counselor to Idomeneo, but he's also somebody who is unafraid to try out new ideas once his son takes over as the king, and Ilya is just as forward-thinking but also maintains her sweet virginal status. The high priest of Neptune sort of looks more like a cult priest to illustrate that he is somebody who keeps to his roots. And the interesting thing about how the opera ends is that it's not only Eletra that ends up getting spirited away, it's also Idomeneo. After he gives Idamante his regal robes, he is then confronted by Arbace and his followers that he should just give it up because his era as king is over and it's time for him to go away to the land of shadows where he'll never be seen again, which also troubles Idamante because now he has to rule his kingdom without his father by his side. And that's also deviating from the original score because in the original libretto, Idomeneo joins in the rejoicing alongside his son and his daughter-in-law with Eletra either exiling herself or committing suicide. But it's also to show the progress of going from an old king to the new king and the new king has to make these new rules so that the people can live in harmony and peace, especially since that huge skull is gone and that there's going to be no more sacrifices, just love and tolerance and harmony, which Idamante is completely unsure how to do it without his beloved father, although his father in this production of Idomeneo wasn't really that much of a great king, but more of an anti-heroic tyrant. And we're not just talking about the costumes of the main characters, but also the costumes of the chorus members as well as the dancers. As I stated before, the more feudal era costumes represent a sort of want for death, violence, and war, while the people wearing more 17th century to 18th century costumes represent a way forward in society as well as in civilization, thus embracing openness as well as tolerance and harmony. And there is that dichotomy present between war and violence and peace and harmony that is pervasive throughout this production of Idomeneo. So this production of Idomeneo by David McVicker had some very interesting and intricate costume choices, set choices, and directions. And while it may not have that pomp and regalness found in Jean-Pierre Ponel's production of Idomeneo, it still had a lot to go for in terms of the directions taken, found in the Asian and Middle Eastern influences of this production. And now we get to the singer starting off with Andrew Staples as Idomeneo. While he did act the role with sufficient anti-villainousness as well as ambiguity, even to the point where he found the dichotomy of Idomeneo being this powerful king and wants to be this hero for the people, but somebody 
who just doesn't want to give up his old rule and even give up his rule as a king to his own son and is antagonistic towards him, his voice lacked that heroic sword-like quality that I associate with tenors singing Idomeneo, and it also lacked that extra meat that I love in tenor singing this role. The problems I had with Andrew Staples' voice was that he was nasal, he was masky, and he just didn't sound heroic enough. He sounded more like a character tenor, which is an absolute shame because this opera lives and dies by its title hero. And it does not live and die by Elettra, Idamante, Ilia, Arbace, the Grand Priest, and the voice of Neptune. It lives and dies by its main hero, Idomeneo, who I have in my ears are stronger tenors who sang this role, such as Richard Lewis, Rudolf Schock, Nikolai Geda, Stuart Burroughs, George Shirley, Luciano Pavarotti, Vislav Ochman, Philip Langridge, Stuart Kale, and Kurt Streit, just to name a few, because their voices were secure, they were regal, and they had excellent techniques, especially when it came to Richard Lewis and Rudolf Schock, who had excellent squillo, and Nikolai Geda, who was more lyrical in timbre, but also had that beautiful voice to back him up. Oh, and lest I forget about Wislav Ochman, who also had that strength in his voice, that meatiness in his voice, that reminded us, the listeners, that Idomeneo is first and foremost a king, and a warrior king at that. Andrew Staples was insufficient in that heroic quality because he sounded nasal, he sounded almost too much like a character tenor, and the problems with his nasal vocal production meant that he couldn't make Idomeneo sufficiently heroic, let alone sufficiently macho. But he did show moments of slight improvements in the later parts of the opera, but that's not really enough to quell the overall disappointment I had with Andrew Staples as Idomeneo. If he could just work less with the mask and work more with the pharynx, as well as dig into some really good chest tones, as well as coordinate his head voice and chest voice well, then I'm sure that his voice could be a whole lot better as Idomeneo. But as he was, he was lacking in the extra support and the extra beefiness that should otherwise define such a regal and heroic role such as Idomeneo. But all of those gaping caveats that I had with Andrew Staples' voice as Idomeneo aside, I thought that his characterization was well done, and he does show the heroic side of Idomeneo as well as his uglier sides, thus making him quite captivating as an actor, although his vocal resources do need a lot more improvement. To say that I had my doubts of hearing and seeing Olga Peretiatko as Elettra is a mere understatement. I was beyond skeptical and extremely fearful for her because Olga Peretiatko is the last soprano I would ever associate in a role such as Elettra. And if you know me when it comes to any singers who dare sing Elettra, I prefer a true dramatic coloratura soprano singing this role, let alone any dramatic soprano with good coloratura. Sure, there are dramatic sopranos and spinto sopranos such as Birgit Nilsson and Enrique Tatares, but I also prefer voices such as Maria Stada, Ray Woodland, Joan Sutherland, Pauline Tinsley, who was also a fine dramatic soprano, Hildegard Behrens, whose voice could also go astride the spinto and dramatic soprano repertoires, Edda Moza, Monica Pick Hieronimi, Faye Robinson, although her voice is quite on the light side, but she had very good technique. Carol Neblet, Roberta Alexander, Mariela Devia, Sally Wolf, Kathleen Casello, Helen Kwon, and Claudia Kunz Eisenlohr, because these were fine sopranos, whether they be dramatic soprano, a spinto soprano, or most of all, a dramatic coloratura soprano who sang Elettra to the best of their abilities especially Edna Moza, who brought in a lot of fire and passion and fury to this particular princess. With Olga Peretiatko, yes, I can give her credit for bringing out the tenderness of Elettra, especially in her aria Idol Mio. 
I can give her credit for what she was able to do with her chest tones. I can give her credit for what she was able to accomplish as Eletra in terms of making her a regal princess and not just some raving lunatic madwoman. And she did hit that final high C with abandon after singing Doreste Dayace. But the fact still remains that her voice was too light and too lyrical for something as dramatic and demanding as Eletra. This is a voice I would rather hear singing Zdenka from Arabella and Melisande from Peleas and Melisande. Not something like Eletra and what she's been doing with Lucrezia Borgia as well as Anna Bolena. Those roles are a definite no-no for Peretiatko and she should have just remained with a light lyric soprano repertoire. Because her coloratura wasn't really that good and how she tried to sing as dramatically as possible sometimes resorted in her sounding shrieky and shrill as well as unsupported and even sharp on most occasions. When it came to the more charged up and dramatic moments, there were occasions in which she did feel uncomfortable in letting her voice out. And I would highly prefer that a true dramatic coloratura soprano, like what we've been having with Anna Dorlovsky and Hulkar Sabirova, take over as Eletra, because Olga Peretiatko's light soprano voice just doesn't cut it in that role. She might have had the sufficient regalness to make Eletra come alive, but her vocal resources were extremely insufficient despite trying her best in that particular role. It's just that a true dramatic coloratura soprano is necessary to make Eletra come alive. I thought that Linar Frilich stole the show as Arbace. Yes, his voice might not have been as big and loud such as Peta Schreier's or Hermann Winkler's, or even that of Thomas Moses. But what he was able to do with Arbace was infuse him with so much charisma and charm, as well as sufficient youthful virility that made Arbace come to life as a character, as well as an overall right-hand man, and an overall human being. This is an Arbace who does show concern for Idomeneo and shows loads of concern for Ilya, especially in her moments of doubt and even in his moments of doubt. So his characterization of Arbace was well done, especially helped with his sufficiently beautiful and well-coordinated light lyric tenor voice that managed to reach some really impossible heights. For instance, in his rendition of Sel Tu Duol, he managed to hit a high D that I did not expect him to sing because usually when I think of tenors singing Sel Tu Duol, I would usually expect them to hit high C at the most. But here, Lina Freeling just went all out and let his voice out with abandon. The same thing can be said about his second aria. He also hit a high D as well as a high C, thus making him steal the show from nearly everybody's feet. And, pardon my French, he totally rocked in that role. Even though his voice wasn't really as incisive or really huge, let alone really full, Linard Frilink managed to sing Arbace with full abandon and also gave his vocal prowess a go with some very interesting choices for high notes. And I do salute his efforts for what he was able to do with Arbace. Magdalena Kojena was a sufficiently decent idamante, complete with imbuing this young prince with nobility, charisma, and loads of innocence, but also a bit of naivete considering that he worships the ground that his father walks on. But despite her interesting characterization, her vocal prowess left a lot to be desired. While I do love the color of her voice, and while I do love that sufficient plushness that she had, the coordination that she had between chest voice and head voice left so much to be desired. It also says something that the likes of Greta Menzel, Margareta Elkins, Janet Baker, Jesse Norman, Frederica von Stade, Maria Ewing, and anne Sophie von Otter in her prime had far more chest and head voice coordination, especially where Margareta Elkins, Frederica von Stade, and Maria Ewing are concerned, although they do go the route of sounding more soprano-ish. But I thought that Magdalena Kojena was lacking in coordinating her chest voice and head voice well. Nevertheless, I can give her props for at least singing this role well, 
and for at least imbuing Idamante with sufficient boyhood charm and likability and making a youthful innocent whose journey to manhood is not really that easy at all. Despite some of Magdalena Cogena's vocal issues, I still have to give her credit where credit was due because the tone that she was able to produce as Idamante was quite lovely to listen to. And all problems aside, I thought that she was able to sing Idamante quite well. Ana Prohaska also stole the show with her sweetness, loveliness, and sheer girlish beauty as Ilya. Yes, exponents such as Lisa de la Casa, Agnes Giebel, Teresa Stich Randall, Lucia Pop, Ileana Cotrubash, Heather Harper, Christiane Edapierre, Leona Mitchell, Luciana Serra, Mariela Devia, Barbara Hendricks, Yvonne Kenny, Ruth Ann Swenson, Henrietta Bonda Hansen, and Dorothea Rushman can never ever be replicated, let alone be forgotten. Because whether those aforementioned singers were lyric coloratura sopranos, light lyric sopranos, or full lyric sopranos, oh, unless they forget about Pilar Lorengar, who also not only combined that girlishness, but also had that sufficient steel in her voice to make Ilya a strong character. So whether they were all those type of sopranos, be they lyric coloratura, light lyric, or full lyric, those voices could never ever be forgotten because they had superb techniques and had great coordination with sufficient beauty in size as well as volume. Ana Prohaska's voice as Ilya may not be the most voluminous, but it had sufficient girlish beauty that made Ilya come alive as a character and that made Ilya's innocence all the more endearing to listen to as well as witness on stage. Miss Prohaska radiated with a certain sweetness and loveliness and ingenue vulnerability that made me as the audience root for Ilya to have her happy ending with Idamante, especially evidenced in her arias Padre Germania Dio, Se il Padre Perdei, and Sefiretti Lusinghieri, in which that Arya was her best moment ever. There was sweetness in her emission, and there was that youthful beauty that Anna Prohaska has been very well known for. Yes, she will never reach the likes of Lucia Pop, or even that of Eliana Kotrubash, let alone Teresa Stichrando, Heather Harper, and Christiana Edapiel. But Anna Prohaska with her lovely light lyric soprano voice that had a sweet emission and that was sufficiently clear was in a class of her own. And here's also hoping that I get to see and hear her challenge herself a lot more with all of these wonderful roles in the light lyric soprano repertoire because she has been maintaining that as her main bread and butter for many years and she shows no signs of stopping. So I definitely have to salute Anna Prohaska for a job well done as Ilya. Florian Hoffmann was a fine high priest of Neptune, but there were occasions in which I was not buying his whitish nasal tone. That's not to say that his characterization was bad or was lacking. His characterization did show some sufficient strength, and he was sufficiently stoic on stage the showing that the high priest is not one character to mess with. But his vocal production left a lot to be desired, and I do miss that richness and fullness that I love in many a light lyric tenor singing the role of the high priest. But that is otherwise quite the dent to pay for such fine characterization of the high priest, even though I would really love a lot more vocal strength in that particular role. Regardless, Florian Hoffmann did what he could with his character tenor voice to make the high priest come alive, but the whitish tone slash nasality in his voice did not really sell me. At least when it came to Jan Martinik as the voice of Neptune, he managed to use his plush and sufficiently round basso cantante slash basso profondo voice to make the role of Neptune imposing and strong, thus making him steal the show even though he was an offstage voice. There was also some sufficiently beautiful singing accomplished by Marie-Sophie Jakob, Ekaterina Haika-Rubinstein, Johan 
Krugius and Friedrich Hamel, respectively as the two Cretan girls and the two Trojan soldiers whose voices were beautiful both individually and together. And here's also hoping that these fine young singers continue to develop their techniques in the right way possible because there is a nice future for each of these young singers. So overall, the singing was really hit or miss. Although I was extremely unimpressed with Andrew Staples' nasal voice as Idomeneo because he was lacking in that heroic meat and sword-like quality required for this role, and Olga Peretiatko's insufficient vocal resources as Eletra because I do expect a stronger and steelier dramatic coloratura singing this role, I do have to salute Linar Frilink as Arbace, Anna Prohaska as Ilya, Florian Hoffman using his character tenor voice for the role of the high priest, well, although his voice was quite whitish and nasal, and Jan Martinik, who managed to sing up a storm as the voice of Neptune. These five singers, with some exceptions reserved for Magdalena Kojena as Idamante, and Florian Hoffman as the high priest were in tip-top shape, especially Linar Frilink, who sang up a storm as Arbace, despite his voice not being mega incisive, but that is neither here nor there, because he was a valiant light lyric tenor who just sang with abandon and just sang his heart out, and Anna Prohaska taking advantage of her girlish timbre and absolute sweetness as Ilya, and lest I forget about the fine jobs accomplished by Marie Sophie Jakob, Ekaterina Heika Rubinstein, Johann Krugius, and Friedrich Hamel for their respective roles of the two Cretan girls and the two Trojan soldiers for having such fine voices all around, and of course for strengthening tonight's performance of Idomeneo. So me not being a fan of Andrew Staples and Olga Peretetko aside, I still have to give top marks especially to Anna Prohaska, Linar Frilig, and Jan Martinik for such fine jobs in their respective roles, and some pats on the back to Magdalena Kojena and Florian Hoffman for doing solid jobs in their respective roles although I would love a lot more coordination, a lot more meat in their voices. The conducting done by Sir Simon Rattle was excellent as always. He managed to tease out some nuances in the orchestra, and he was a very cognizant and conscientious conductor who made sure that everybody went along and made sure that no one was left behind. And I give him high marks for what he was able to accomplish with that orchestra, and the chorus and orchestra of the Staatsoper Unter den Linden were, as always, reliable. David McVicker's production of Mozart's Idomeneo is rather interesting and intricate in its own space special way, and it did have a lot of wonderful ideas going for it, although I was not too crazy about how the ending of this production strayed from the opera's original ending, but its singers did leave a lot to be desired, especially when it came to Andrew Staples, who was very nasal as Idomeneo, and Olga Peretiatko as Eletra, whose vocal resources were insufficient as this deranged princess, but high marks really have to go to Linar Frilink as Arbace, Anna Pro Haska as Ilya and Jan Martinik as the voice of Neptune for singing their roles very well. But I also have to give some credit to Magdalena Kojena as Idamante and Florian Hoffman as the High Priest for what they were able to do with their respective roles, although I would have loved to have a lot more coordination in their voices as well as more consistency. Nevertheless, there was great conducting to be had with Sir Simon Rattle, who really brought up the orchestra to such a great standard. And I saluted him for what he was able to do with not only the orchestra, but also what he was able to collaborate with Martin Wright as the chorus master. And for those of you who caught David McVicker's production of Mozart's Idomeneo at the Staatsoper und den Linden, what'd you think of it? Did you really enjoy the production as a whole? And did you find it very interesting? Was there a singer that you thought was the strongest out of all the cast of singers? Or did you feel like this production, as well as the cast of singers, were not your cup of tea? 
please comment below and let me know because I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. Well, that's it for my review of Mozart's Idomen Neo at the Staatsoper unter den Linden. Tune in tomorrow for my review of Victoria Randem's lead concert also at the Staatsoper unter den Linden. So until then, good night everybody.